Canada refuses to even uh, uh, ban Israeli goods made in the occupied territories. So Canada refuses to even do these small things. You know, even Canada refuses to even sanction Israel. So to then say that Canada would be willing to take the ultimate leap, which is to arrest Netanyahu. I mean, if Canada is not willing to do these small, smaller things, uh, these smaller, meaningful things, I can't imagine Justin Trudeau willing to take the ultimate jump. So I think that would ultimately prove if Netanyahu is able to come here and he isn't arrested and he's able to leave, that would prove that Netanyahu is above the rule of law, officially above the rule of law. Uh, I would like us now to go to the second part of this uh, interview where I want to talk to you about Canadian foreign policy. That's kind of the, the heart of uh, much of your work of the last couple of years. Everybody, I'm still talking to Pitatana Shamugatas, who is the, uh, who created a wonderful, wonderful uh, um, a documentary of the title Truth to the Powerless, an investigation into Canada's foreign policy. And for your documentary, you already interviewed a lot of Canadian foreign policy makers on the highest levels. And recently you talked again to, I believe he was one of your former professors, right? And he's currently the, or was he not? Maybe I'm mixing him up, but you you talked to Bob Ray and uh, he he was the, he is the current Canadian uh, ambassador to the United Nations. And you asked him about Canada's stance on, on, on Israel and, and also, on, on, especially on Ukraine and, 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 and Russia. And your documentary already it kind of dismantled this view that Canada is this inherently peace-loving country that would never ever uh, use force in foreign policy and, and, and is only a peacemaker. Um, where does Canada's foreign policy stand today? And how was that interview with Bob Ray? Uh, I think that Canada's foreign policy, especially in light of the, um, the, uh, the uh, the decision by the uh, the chief prosecutor for the International Criminal Court, uh, his his decision to want to issue arrest warrants against uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu as well as the uh, uh, the leader of uh, of Hamas, and uh, uh, Canada's kind of uh, put in a position where now you know, Canada's claimed for the longest time that it adheres to the rules based international order. Well, now, if, if those warrants are, are are issued, Canada, as a party, as a signatory to the Rome Statute, will have an obligation, if Netanyahu lands in Canada, he will have an obligation, uh, Canada will have an obligation to arrest Netanyahu, if, because we're a signatory to the Rome Statute, if, 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 a, uh, if an individual that's wanted by the International Criminal Court and the arrest warrant is out, if they land in a country that's a signatory to the Rome Statute, they have to be arrested. Uh, that's if, your obligation. If the, court, if the court actually issues the warrant. I mean, that's correct. If the court it's issues. Requested. But, mm. It's requesting it, yeah. So if they, issue, if they issue the arrest warrant, then Canada has an obligation. So, so I, asked, um, I, asked, I, asked, I actually asked Bob Ray this question recently because we are – we we are friends, so I asked him this question recently, and he just he just looked at it and, and didn't respond back to me. So it's uh, you know, because I asked him, you know, well, if Canada, if 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 the arrest warrants are issued, would Justin Trudeau uh, arrest Netanyahu if he will if he comes to Canada? And and Bob Ray didn't have a response for me. Uh, so I think that's kind of where Canada is right now. It's it's grappling with how to um. Uh, adhere to its profet's claim for rules-based international order uh, while still trying to maintain that facade and while still trying to appease the United States that very much still supports, uh, uh, you know, Israel and really opposes any accountability towards uh, superpowers uh, and allows them to get away with heinous atrocities. Uh, uh, so that's where I think Canada right now says, stands as far as foreign policy is concerned. My interview with Bob Ray, uh, it was it was it was quite an interesting interview. It took a few months to actually get. I had to go through the proper channels in in Ottawa, Global Affairs Canada, uh, you know, uh, which is the foreign policy affairs uh, you know bureau of 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 our government here. And uh, it took a few months to get, and I I prefaced the interview with saying that my questions to you 
will be about Canada's adherence to the rules-based international order. And true to my word, all of my questions were about Canada's adherence to the rules-based international order. So one of my questions was about why does Canada consistently vote against the UN treaty on the prohibition, ratifying the UN treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons you know, at, the, at, uh, you know, at the United Nations? Uh, you know, isn't and how does this uh, uh, conform to Canada's stated adherence to its rules-based international order? That you know, that's one of the questions that I asked uh, Bob Ray, and his response was something to the effect of, "Well, you know, it's not practical to simply just have this resolution. There has to be concrete steps, you know, that have to be for blah blah blah, you know, <laughs> which you know, it doesn't make any sense really." And uh, um, you know, one of my other questions were about, you know, how does, can why does Canada uh, vote against resolutions that are critical of Israel's settlement activity, but then votes in favor of UN resolutions that support a two-state solution? How do you have a two-state solution when you vote, when you're, when you vote against resolutions that are critical of Israel's settlement activity, given that settlements impede the uh, the ability to have a two state solution doesn't doesn't this conflict with Canada's uh, rules based international order and its own Canada's own foreign policy uh, 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 guidelines is that uh, we do not recognize Israel's uh, 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 territory which it, Israel's uh, territory which it illegally occupies Israel's uh, you know territory post. 1967, which it occupies, Palestinian territory, which it illegally occupies, says Canada does not recognize it. That's our official policy. Yet in the UN, we vote against settlement, against resolutions that are critical of Israel's settlement activity. So how do you reconcile that? Isn't that contradictory? And well, and Barbara said, no, it's not. And I just gave very, you know, establishment answers. Um, and of course, Russia, Ukraine was the most contentious because uh, when I asked uh, Bob Ray about, given that you know it's been two years since uh, the war has gone on, more than 30,000 Ukrainian soldiers have died, Russia is increasingly uh, occupying more and more territory. Uh, do you think that Canada should call for a diplomatic solution to end the war whereby uh, Canada, whereby, uh, uh, Russia agrees to uh, withdraw from a significant portion of the of the land, the Ukrainian land that it occupies, in return for a written guarantee that NATO uh, that Ukraine will not join NATO and for provisions of Ukraine's <laughs> neutrality. And uh, Bob Ray's response was, "Are you kidding? Are you serious?" That that was his response. And then uh, and then he proceeded to malign me. Uh, uh, I, 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 I uh, encourage everybody who's watching this and, and, and who's interested in this, read this interview. It's, it's written out, right? Um, and at that point, Bob Ray does something very smart. You try to push him into a corner, he, twist, he takes your arm, twists it around and puts you into the corner by immediately uh, building up a strong an argument, basically saying, so, Peter, does that mean that you are against justice? Are you, you are a law student you of all people should be in favor of the law being upheld. I cannot believe what I'm hearing from you, that you're in favor of letting a war criminal walk away and have his, uh, and have his cake and eat it all. And that immediately got you into the defensive position and he weaseled out of the original question that you, that you put to him, which is very true. And what these people tell you, although they don't, they don't say so officially, but they tell you that what, what's more important to them is the ultimate goal. And they, they frame it as justice, but what they mean is victory over Russia, um, which is which is too bad. And I and I told and I and my and when he tried to uh, you know uh, make that act you know when he made that accusation, well, how could I'm 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 shocked you know Juris, which is a legal news publication, which you know and you a law student, how could you make this position, which is that you know Putin. You know, should just uh, you know should just uh, get a pass uh, for all these atrocities that's committed. But what I tried to explain to him is that you know, uh, Putin uh, views uh, the potential of NATO of Ukraine joining NATO as an existential threat to Russia's survival. 
And when nuclear power countries are encountered with an existential threat to their survival, they will not hesitate to use nuclear weapons. And we saw that with the Cuban Missile Crisis, where uh, because the Soviet Union had put uh, nuclear missiles in Cuba, uh, the United States had practically threatened to blow up the whole world, you know, yeah. because the United <laughs> States felt that having nuclear missiles in Cuba so close to its territory was an existential threat to its survival. When nuclear power states are met with an existential threat, they will not hesitate to use <laughs> nuclear weapons. Of course, and you know, by now, by now, it is utterly, completely clear that the entire discourse about every country can choose its own path and its own alliances, it's BS. They're, they're now sanctioning uh, parliamentarians in Georgia over a sovereign decision of having a new law that a majority of people in Georgia uh, 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 accepts and, and, and actually wants for an agent law, which is actually a similar law, a little bit less drastic than the one in the United States. <laughs> so it is, it is absolutely laughable. But the interesting way is how these people frame that stuff, right? Because you, especially this discourse of the in, uh, rules-based international order means that you have to pretend that there are rules that are above everybody and they govern everybody and we use those, but at the same time. And that's where I think it's really important what kind of jargon we use. John Dugard, who I had on this channel about a year ago in summer, and who is now a one of the six uh, lawyers for Israel on the Israeli team in the ICJ. He wrote the first serious paper about how the rules-based international order is not international law and what we do with that and how rules-based international order is a way for people to escape international law, which is actually universal. The rules-based international order, by virtue of not being defined, is a talking point, <laughs> and, but allows you to narratively pretend that there is, that there is an, a law when in fact what it is is like a couple of countries taking the liberty of redefining the rules of to whatever they need them to be at the moment, right? Instead of focusing on international law, which is the actual code that we've got and that we developed over 500 years. Um, so the question to me then to these people is like, so do you believe in rules-based order or in international law? And that, do you know like how he would respond to that or any, any, any indications? I, I, I think that with Bob Ray in particular, he's he's a very frightening individual because I think he believes everything that he's saying, you know, and when and he genuinely believes every word he's saying, he's not putting up an act. He genuinely believes everything that he's saying. So I think that, uh, you know, Bob Ray, um, by profession, is a diplomat. So you would think that as a diplomat, he has a he has a he has a, he has a career as a, as a, a as a diplomat. He he worked as a in a mediator capacity uh, during the Sri Lankan Civil War. I'm Sri Lankan. So that's how my friendship with Bob Ray started is because I've written about the Sri Lankan Civil War extensively. And through that, I came to know of Bob Ray's mediation efforts during the Sri Lankan Civil War to negotiate between both parties to try to bring an end to the war and end the bloodshed of a nearly of a two decade civil war. And so you would think that as a diplomat, you would try and uh, and and look at mediation as the first solution towards any uh, protracted conflict. But the way that Bob Ray goes about, you know, his outlook on foreign policy is kind of whatever is really in the best interests of the powerful. And if that so happens to align with the public conception of rules-based international order, then great. If it doesn't align with this public conception of the rules-based international order, well, then, you know, uh, uh, then that's too bad because well what's really happening is that uh, uh, the aggressor is a is a is a is a Hitler and and uh, it's it's really the you know the, the the victim you know like Ukraine is somebody that needs to be uh, is salvaged by fund thing funding more and more arms and uh, more and more diplomatic and military support. And which just leads to the loss of more and more Ukrainian civilians. You know, what we don't realize is that the longer this war goes on, the more and more territory that uh, Russia will acquire, which is, of course, the invasion is illegal and it's an atrocious invasion and it should be condemned in the strongest terms. And I do condemn the, inter the invasion in my interview with Bob Ray. I state that outright. But what I also 
But uh, what I was also trying to get at during the interview is that the longer the war goes on, while it is a flagrant violation of Russia's actions against international law, uh, the longer the war goes on, the more territory Russia will occupy and the less likely that Ukraine will be able to stand as a viable functioning state. So it's in the interest of Ukraine to push for a diplomatic solution uh, whereby Russia will agree to give up a, not all of the territory it's occupied, but at least a significant amount of it in return for guarantees of Ukraine's neutrality, uh, which also would mean a, a written guarantee that Ukraine will never join NATO. You know, that is in Ukraine's best interest. And Bob Ray, by putting this facade of international rules-based order, even though he has supported every single NATO war, every single NATO conflict, he supported the NATO war uh, in Afghanistan, Libya, uh, Yugoslavia. He supported every NATO aggression, which uh, uh, which went which was uh, counter to international law. The Libyan invasion, the in, in the uh, the bombing of Kosovo in uh, 1999. This was counter to international law, but Bob Ray had no problem with that. So rules-based international order for Bob Ray is 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 a tool to serve him uh, when it can serve the interests of the powerful, and when it can't, well, then you kind of disregard it and you kind of uh, you know turn the tables around and you accuse the victim uh, of being the aggressor and vice versa. Yeah, I mean, by now it is uh, it is clear that that's what rules based international order means. Uh, again, by virtue of there no being any written rules. I mean, I've never seen these rules. Everybody talks about the rules. I've never seen them. The rules based international order. I've never seen these rules. And nobody says these rules are equivalent to international law. If they were, you would it would be redundant, right? Um, so the the fun thing about this is it's a pure talking point. And then the, the narrative uh, trick is to say that what we do is based on rules uh, on this order, because by virtue of us attacking other countries, we've already established that we now have the right to do so. Why, when anyone else does something similar or comparable, then it's immediately declared uncom incomparable and outside the, the order, right? Outside the rules. And, um, and this is just, I mean, this makes so little to no sense that uh, it's getting really intellectually insulting at this point. That this is still being, this, this fiction is still being kept alive, which then begs the question to me whether these people actually believe that. I mean, do they not comprehend it? Because like diplomats, a lot of diplomats, not all of them, but a lot, especially career diplomats. And as far as I understand, Bob Ray is a career diplomat. They are very smart in the sense that they have seen a lot of actual on the ground diplomacy working and actual on the ground people trying to wiggle and weasel out with uh, stupid argumentations. They are masters at that, right? And and defending something that they personally maybe even don't, don't really believe in. I've seen diplomats like that too, who officially defend their country, but an official will tell you, look, I, I don't agree with that, but there's nothing I can do. Uh, so I, I have to, and I have to be smart and clever about it. Um, for Canada's foreign policy, do you do you believe that there will be this tipping point when when Canada will be forced, like let's say through an ICC warrant, to do something that the U.S. will condemn? Because Canada, just like European countries, I mean, we are satellites at this point. <laughs> We're utterly dependent on what Washington decides, and then we just copy paste that basically with like a little bit of a European or Canadian flavor to it. Um, do you think we'll get out of that? That's, I mean, that's a very, uh, 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 you know, interesting situation because I'm not, you know, Canada as a signatory to the Rome Statute does have an obligation to, um, if if an arrest warrant is put, it is issued against uh, Netanyahu, uh, Canada does have an obligation as a treaty to, as a signatory to the Rome Statute to arrest Netanyahu if he if he comes, uh, if he lands on Canadian soil. But whether the United whether Canada would be willing to jeopardize its relationship with the United States, uh, that's that's a really interesting situation. I don't think Justin Trudeau has the um, has the has the guts to do that, and uh, he isn't somebody who is um, ideologically principled. You know, he is somebody who's like a you know like a pop a populist who's a was just somebody who wants to be in the mainstream, who somebody just wants to, uh, 
appeal to slogans and brands who is kind of void of any substance. His politics is void of substance or any significant meaning. And he's not somebody who's a very uh, a, a, a learned, uh, you know, academic or a, or a political ideologue. He's just somebody who kind of parrots the the mainstream narrative and just tries to, uh, you know, dupe people with slogans. So uh, I don't think he's somebody who would uh, be willing to sacrifice uh, the backlash, the enormous backlash that would come about if Canada does arrest Netanyahu. So I don't, I just don't think there isn't any indication that Canada, I mean, we can't, we've been slow to even sanction um, uh, settlers uh, in the West Bank that are carrying out atrocities against Palestinians, Israeli settlers, and we have sanctioned some, but Canada has been very slow. And you know the United States has sanctioned, Joe Biden has sanctioned a few, uh, but Canada could sanction far more. Could be far more aggressive. Canada could, for instance, um, uh, uh, abide by uh, refusing to sell Israeli goods that are made in the occupied territories, which would be in conformity with Canada's official foreign policy guidelines, which refuses to recognize. Uh, Israel's uh, territory that Israel has occupied, Palestinian territory that is like, occupied uh, uh, illegally. Uh, so Canada doesn't, Canada refuses to even uh, uh, ban Israeli goods made in the occupied territories. So Canada refuses to even do these small things. You know, even Canada refuses to even sanction Israel. So to then say that Canada would be willing to take the ultimate leap which is to arrest Netanyahu. I mean, if Canada is not willing to do these small, smaller things, uh, these smaller, meaningful things, I can't imagine Justin Trudeau willing to take the ultimate jump. So I think that would ultimately prove if Netanyahu is able to come here and he isn't arrested and he's able to leave, that would prove that Netanyahu is above the rule of law, officially above the rule of law. And we haven't that that situation hasn't been tested because last year in summer there was this case if if Vladimir Putin goes to South uh, uh, South Africa then South Africa would be obliged to arrest him and that wasn't tested because Vladimir Putin actually didn't go um, so we haven't had that situation yet but it would be um, this will be something to look out for if that if that arrest warrant actually comes which like all of us are uh, at this point are just hoping in order to to increase the heat and the pressure on uh on on stopping this genocide uh the 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 one more question for me is the the of the public this the official discourse of canada at the un about what's happening is canada still on board with uh you know 35000 dead palestinians is all self defense and uh there is this is all fine and, and and good and we are we are in favor of sending more weapons does canada send weapons probably not right um where is the official line at the moment so canada uh, uh this is one of the questions that i asked bob ray in my interview with him you know uh i told him you know how how can canada uh send uh, you know uh, arms sales there, there was a there was a there was a report that came out that Canada after October 7th was uh, selling arms to Israel and uh Bob Ray was very quick to pin me on that and say that Canada does not sell arms to Israel well he didn't know that I said well when people say Canada sells arms to Israel what we're talking about is the fact that Canada sells weapons components to Israel which are then used in Israel's, uh, you know, like it's it's jets, uh, you know, it, it, it's uh, it, it's various forms of military machinery that it uses in the occupied territories to kill Palestinians. The Canada's weapons components, which are sold to the U.S., which the U.S. then gives to Israel uh, as part of its its weapon systems, uh, that is used to kill Palestinians. So when Canada, when people say Canada should stop selling arms to Israel, that's what they were talking about. And uh, Nicaragua has taken uh, is uh, is taking Canada uh, to the International Court of Justice alongside the United Kingdom, Germany, and the Netherlands for its arms sales to Israel. So we see now that Canada is being held account, you know, is being is trying to be held accountable at the international stage for its role in the death of more than thirty thousand Palestinians. So you know, I, and and when I when I asked uh, uh, you know Bob Ray that he was 
yeah, uh, you know, he says he he responded that I do not agree with your um, assertion and I do not agree with your assumption. That was his response when I told him, you know, well, what about these weapon components that we're selling to to is you know Israel, which are they being used to kill these Palestinians? So, you know, he he was very testy when he found out that I couldn't um, I wouldn't fall for the establishment line, which is that we don't sell arms to Israel, and that kind of just shuts people up. It's like, oh, well, I guess you don't. Well, actually, you do. You know? Well, well done. It's one of these moments when probably he might not agree personally with this, but he has to toe the line. And then he, um, I, I do wonder how this, how this will continue. Do you have any more contacts in the foreign policy circles of Canada that you either interviewed or going to interview about, about this? Because it's getting, you know, um, still supporting the Israeli side of this conflict. Um, even if you call for a ceasefire, um, not not putting on pressure on Israel. It's becoming more and more untenable in for public opinion. So this is this is getting uh, this is getting really precarious now for for uh, politicians all over the place because public opinion does matter, which is why the crackdown was so huge in trying to to justify it through media the the actions of the Netanyahu government and of the Israeli state actually because this is not just Netanyahu it's more um, there's this huge public uh, approval in Israel for these uh, for, for these policies and that that puts us uh, that 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 creates this problem that we have is like how do we approach such a such atrocities on an international scale that are that have such so much domestic support when you cannot say it's just it's just the government. I mean that's another one of these smoke screens, right? Of people in, in the West saying like ah Netanyahu is bad, but you know, overall Israel is fine and, and, and the Israeli society of course would is actually wants peace. But no, no, we know they don't want that because it has been professed over and over. That's part of the problem. It's part of the problem that needs some sort of uh, humanistic solution, right? Uh, because the solution can't be to just expel all the Jews, right? That can, that cannot be another solution, right? You, we need a solution in, through which the people are fine, the Palestinians and the Jews, right? Everybody needs to be okay. Uh, the question is, how do, how do we get there? Um, are, you, are you going to, need to do more interviews about, about this problem in Canada? Uh, I would like to, but it's... Uh... I, mean, I, I did an entire documentary where one of the episodes we did was on Canada's support for uh, Israeli apartheid. And I interviewed Canada's former ambassador uh, to Israel under the Stephen Harper government. He was the he was he was uh, the predecessor. It was Justin Trudeau's predecessor. He was the prime minister of Canada uh, from 2006 to 2015. And uh, I also interviewed uh, uh, the UN Special Rapporteur, who was at the time uh, was also a Canadian, um, uh, Michael Link, uh, on Palestine. So I've, I've interviewed these Canadian figures, and I've interviewed members of Parliament. And I think that um, uh, I think I think somebody like myself has kind of uh, reached the, the 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 top of the echelon as far as I'm permitted to go. If I was a mainstream journalist, I could interview the prime minister and, and uh, he probably wouldn't like me after that and I probably wouldn't keep my job. But as far as uh, I think the top the top that I was able to go was Bob Ray, who was the current, you know, uh, uh, Canada's uh, ambassador to the United Nations. I don't think I can really go more top than that. Uh, but there are other Canadians out there that are um, uh, approaching uh, uh Canadian politicians like Eve Engler, who was a Canadian activist and dissident, he often goes and 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 goes and heckles politicians and, and goes and confronts them and asks them, "How do you support you know uh, you know all these atrocities that Canada's part of?" And I think that's probably you know something that that I could support and um, you know I'd love to get involved in that, but it's uh, <laughs> I, I I I my interviewing style is very unique in the sense that. I like to allow the person to speak, and I like to just uh, allow the allow the establishment figures to speak, and then get, you know, some truth gems out of them. Try to engage with them in a conversation rather than just yell at them, because then it just becomes like you're just presenting one view, and then they can just shut you down as being crazy. Whereas if you're willing to just speak with them, you could get some truth gems out of them. So that's kind of what I did with the Bob Ray interview, and that's what I did with my Canada foreign policy theories so i don't have any interviews lined up as far as canadian politicians are concerned but um 
Uh, I do have some interviews lined up that I want to do about, uh, you know, the Palestinian cause and just uh, interviewing key Palestinian figures uh, and, and really uh, bringing to light people like Marwan Barghouti and why he's so important. The fact that he's the most popular Palestinian in the, in the, in the occupied territories and why anybody who supports uh, a just resolution for the Palestinian conflict needs to know who he is and should support and put pressure on the United States to call for his release. The United States has actually, uh, the U.S. State Department actually raised concerns with Netanyahu about his treatment, uh, Marwan Begwidi's treatment in Israeli prison because he's been tortured and and really subject to inhumane conditions after October 7th. So certainly I think that's one of the tactics that we should pursue. And that, that's something that I want to do and really bring to light to the international community that this is somebody who we need to get behind because he's really favored and he's credible and he's uncorrupted. So I think that's what I want to do as far as the Palestinian issue is concerned. Okay, everybody, um, I recommend you following uh, Pita on, on his various channels. Where can people find you? What's the best way of following your work? So uh, you, can follow, you can follow me on Twitter, uh, Twitter slash uh, it, it's 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 my, it's my name. Uh, it's my P I T A S A N N A. So that's 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 my Twitter handle. Just my name. You can follow me there, and uh, there I'll share with um, you know my articles, the interviews that I've done. Uh, uh, that's one way you can follow me. You can also follow me on on Jurist as well, where I occasionally post interviews that I do, and also my docu series as well, Truth to the Powerless dot com. Okay, well, everybody, follow Pita. Um, thank you very much for your time today and good luck with your interviews. We'll do an update again in the future. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure.